Hey, everybody. Uh, yeah, like Chad said, I'm Dave Bosher. Uh, those of you that, that know me, hello. Those of you that don't, I'm a pastor um, out in Alto, Michigan at Lakeside Community Church. Um, and I am excited today to be able to uh, talk with uh, Jonathan Van Maren, in part because, um, you know, pornography, I don't know about you, but pornography is something I run into all the time in the lives of my parishioners in ministry. And indeed, it's it's actually a part of my story where God had to do something really important in my life. Um, and um, I want other people to have that same freedom, too. Now, um, Jonathan, um, he's a communications director for, an, for a national pro-life organization, um, and he's an author and he's a commentator. I myself am just starting to get familiarized with his work, but it's already been helpful for me. Uh, but he also happens to have a special uh, interest um, in the effects of pornography on society at large, but also on the church in particular. So, um, Jonathan, welcome. Really good to have you here. Uh, now, I, I gave you know some some basic details, but uh, take a minute and introduce us to yourself a little bit further. Well, it's great to be with uh, be with all of you uh, talking about I think one of the most important topics we can talk about uh, in the current century and in the current year. Just to get a bit of background about myself, uh, yeah, I work I work full time for a pro life organization. I'm also contributing editor for a European magazine. Uh, I write for First Things, the American Conservative, uh, Christianity Today, a number of different publications. And all of the writing I do really focuses on our post-Christian culture and how our culture became post-Christian and what it means to be a Christian in a culture that's increasingly shifting from post-Christianity to anti-Christianity. And what's so interesting about the issue of pornography in particular is that pornography exacerbates every single other problem that we see. So if you look at what's taking place on the news with regards to the culture wars, mm -hmm. pornography is making almost every single one of those problems worse. With regards to my personal interest in the issue of pornography, and I've been speaking on the issue in Christian communities now for over 10 years, I've spoken in every major reform denomination on the issue of pornography, talked to thousands of kids about this issue, uh, is because pornography has affected the lives of essentially every single person that I know. And it's made the lives of virtually every single person I know worse. That's probably true for everybody listening, whether they know it or not. Pornography is now so pervasive and so poisonous in our culture that I truly believe it's the number one threat facing the church, facing marriages, facing families, mm. and especially post-pandemic, I've seen pornography go from a problem in every church to something increasingly that's become the norm, even inside church communities, especially in the last four to five years. Yeah, so about that. By the way, as we go further, I'm going to ask a couple questions as we go. Um um, and in some cases, I'm just going to be winding up Jonathan and letting him go because he has so much amazing stuff to say. Uh, but for those of you as you're listening, um, if you want to, if you have questions, go ahead and write those in the chat um, as we are having our discussion now. Um, and then at the end, I'm going to ask some of those to Jonathan, but there's no need to hold those back. But um, I'll, I'll lead in with it, with it this way, because I, I agree with you. I think you are absolutely spot on on all counts. However, um, if you were to talk to uh, the culture at large mm -hmm. about the problem of pornography and the downstream consequences of it, um, maybe maybe I'm wrong, but unless I've lost touch, it seems like a lot of the culture would say, well, it's not really a problem or it doesn't have to be a problem. So if you had to have a conversation with somebody um, who is either on that naive end of the spectrum or perhaps somebody who's who's young and just doesn't understand, and you had to start explaining just how serious a problem this actually is to a culture that already regards it as normal, uh, how would you start to explain that? It's a really interesting question because I, I did do that. I was uh, actually on the anti-porn side of a public debate on, on, on national public radio against a queer studies professor on the thesis, is porn good for society? And what's so incredibly interesting is that as we went back and forth on the effects of pornography on our culture, as we took a look at how porn fundamentally objectifies both men, but especially women, uh, as we looked at how pornography is reshaping the sexual tastes and desires of those who watch it and causing them to try out increasingly damaging and degrading behaviors in their own lives, 
as we talked about how people at younger and younger ages are looking at pornography, by the end of the debate, she essentially agreed with me that 90% of pornography was damaging to society and, and, and should be eliminated. And this is now an emerging consensus in secular society. So six American states have passed age verification laws to try and keep young people away from pornography. The United Kingdom has passed an age verification law. Uh, Canadian members of parliament with the support, believe it or not, of Liberal Prime Minister Justin Trudeau have put forward a law to demand age verification. New Zealand and Australia looking at similar uh, laws. Scandinavia is initiating studies into how pornography is reshaping the sexual tastes of the youth. And so five years ago, uh, you, um, what, you, what you said would have been absolutely correct. The secular culture still treated porn basically like a punchline in a comedy sitcom. Now, however, people are recognizing that because we're engaged in essentially a mass digital experiment where everybody at younger and younger ages can access porn so hardcore that our parents wouldn't have been able to find it and our grandparents wouldn't have been able to imagine it, that what we're facing essentially uh, is a society-wide experiment in transforming um, the minds of the youth by feeding digital toxins directly into their frontal cortex. And, and to give you an idea, like I'm not exaggerating when I say this stuff is everywhere. In 2016, before the pandemic, Pornhub released its numbers. They added the hours of pornography watched just on their site into years. And it was 524,641 years of porn. That was a low point in 2020 at the peak of the pandemic. Pornhub was reporting 4.5 trillion page views a month, which is more than the traffic of Google and Facebook combined. And it's, that's one of the top five sites, just one of them. And so because pornography is so pervasive and has reached so many people and is poisoning the young to such an extent, even secular society is wow. now finally coming around and admitting what Christian thinkers have been warning about for a decade and a half. Wow, that is amazing. Uh, well, I'm going to grab onto something, something that you said earlier in, in there. So you were saying that pornography is getting so serious that secular culture is starting to take up and take note. And I, I could, now that you're saying it, I could think of a couple anecdotal examples where that's true, but I want to grab onto the impact of what you were talking about on the mind. You mentioned the impact on the mind of young people in particular, but others in general. Talk to us more about that because how I'm interested to know in, the, in, in that area among others, how exactly it's gotten so bad that even secular culture is starting to do a double take. Well, it's really important to understand the impact of pornography on the mind, because while obviously pornography is a sin issue, it's really essential to understand why pornography is an addictive sin in ways that most other sins aren't. And pornography is fundamentally more addictive than any other addictive substance that Christians and others can struggle with. It's more addictive than alcohol, cigarettes, and according to psychiatrists, even heroin. And the reason for that is really, really simple. It's that we're all created as sexual beings. And so the first drag of a cigarette you take, most people don't enjoy it. I certainly didn't. I coughed my lungs out. The first sip of alcohol that you take, generally you don't like it. Most of this stuff is an acquired taste. And so in order to develop an addiction or a dependency on one of these substances, you have to overcome initial distaste. But with pornography, it's entirely different. Pornography grabs you immediately because it plugs into primal urges and desires that we already have, and very often plugs into natural and even good desires that we already have. And so unlike other addictions, uh, pornography is something that everybody is uniquely vulnerable to. And that used to, it used to be primarily men getting addicted, but now uh, year over year, the rate of women who are addicted, even in the church is going up. At one of the reform schools I spoke at recently, every single girl in grade 11 had struggled with porn within the last 12 months. And so I think what we need to understand about pornography is that when we consume pornography, it, our brain is actually firing off these neurotransmitters known as erototoxins. That's creating neural wiring in our mind. And so every time we consume porn, we're actually strengthening this physical neural wiring in our mind. 
And so Christians have looked at pornography and thought it's a lust sin, it's a spiritual sin. Um, we, we, we get that it's rebellion against God. We need to repent of it. But what they didn't realize is just like smoking too much makes your lungs black or drinking too much hurts your liver. Looking at pornography also has physical consequences in the way that it actually transforms the way that you think and that you see the world. And there's a brilliant book called The Brain That Changes Itself by Dr. Norman Doidge, who unfortunately isn't much recognized for his own work. Everybody knows him as the guy who wrote the foreword to 12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson. Um, but his book is, 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 is just brilliant. He has a whole chapter on the concept of neuroplasticity and how the use of pornography uh, changes our mind. Now, the reason that young people are uniquely susceptible to this is, of course, the younger you are, the more your brain is still in its fundamental developmental period. So young men, our brains don't stop developing until we're 25 years old. And so I'll give you an example. I spoke at a reformed conference recently. I often get phone calls and emails uh, from young people afterwards. Young man phones me and says, I'm hooked on porn. Can't stop. Can you, can you point me in the right direction? Uh, you know, hook me up with an accountability partner. How do I go about this? First question I always ask, uh, when, like, how long have you been addicted? He says, 10 years. I said, how old are you? He said, 15. And he's now the fourth person I talked to in just a couple of months. who was five, six, seven, eight when they got addicted. The average kid in a reformed or Christian community I talked to got hooked in grade six. This means by the time they're in grade 12, um, when many of them are desperate, um, their brains have essentially been formed by pornography because their brains have been wiring themselves to pornography now for six years. It's kind of like, you know, if you break your arm and you don't get the bone set, it heals crooked. Their brains are developing crooked. And I was just at a reform school in Alberta and I had a couple of kids after the presentation, grade 12. And these were the cool kids. I was not a cool kid. Uh, in high school, they were the cool kids. I recognize them when I see them, you know, they're, they know they're jacked and they've got, you know, the cool chain and the cool hairdo. And there's these, these guys were bawling their eyes out. And we're just like, we're so desperate. We, we can't control our own minds. We can't look at girls without seeing them as objects. We can't get the stuff we've seen out of our minds. We're not in control of how we think. And for them to come up and say this after a presentation, as their peers are all filing out, just gives you a hint of how desperate people yeah. are now and how transformative internet pornography has been on their minds. Yeah. One of the things that, that chiming in on that, one of the things that I think uh, we pastors struggle with is the sheer velocity of development on this, because mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I would have been in high school, when I was first getting really hooked and addicted, um, my parents could have never imagined what internet porn, what the consequences of that were on a dial-up connection. My dad understood staying away from magazines. But uh, as naive as my parents looked to me then, that's how far off I am now. Because even now, when I share my own story with teenagers and I talk about what God did in my life, the things I thought, I mean, and for my time, I was incredibly into it. I was very hooked. And yet, um, when I talk to young people, like especially guys in their early 20s, Oh man, my like supposed hardcore addiction back then looks very vanilla by comparison. And so the, like the consequences you're talking about, uh, unfortunately, it's not all that unfamiliar. I've had those same conversations. It's, that's, um, very, it's, that's very difficult for kids to talk about. You're, I'm 34. I graduated high school in 2006. The first iPhone came out in 2007. I was just talking actually to one of my buddies who got addicted in high school. And a lot of my friends went through porn addictions and then, you know, it, it blew up in their marriages and they went through that whole pro like a generation of young men basically had to deal with a porn addiction at some point. And some of their fundamental life experiences and marriages and relationships were, you know, were marred by the fact that pornography was easily available. And he was saying to me, uh, just what you said, I'm so grateful that all I saw was what yeah. hardcore meant in 2007. Because uh, I like I have I get questions from 13 and 14 year old kids in reform schools citing genres of porn that I don't recognize and functionally can't Google for obvious reasons. Well, OK, let me let me ask you this. So you mentioned um, one of the things that you were pressing in on is the, the incredible transformative effect mm -hmm. that pornography has. 
And you, you referenced in passing that there are just immense downstream consequences of that. If you had to enumerate what those consequences look like um, as you look at data and as you talk to individuals, what is downstream of that huge pipeline? What are the consequences of that mental transformation? Well, so if you, if you take the issue of pornography, essentially take any other cultural issue right now, and pornography has played a role in that cultural issue and has made that, that, that issue worse. So if you consider the fact that roughly 90% of young men, um, probably 90% of men, but at least 90% of young men are addicted to a toxic sexual substance that's changing their desires and changing the way they see the opposite sex, uh, over 50% of women and counting. Uh, you have to understand that you simply cannot have an addiction at that population scale and not have it, frankly, affect everything. But I think the thing that disturbs me the most, uh, many of you on um, on this uh, on this podcast will have kids of your own. Um, I my oldest is a daughter, and so, so this research just makes me despair sometimes when I think of what young men are, are are putting in their brain before they're old enough to understand what the word porn is, or before they even know what sex is. Right? These kids are getting addicted uh, at, at ages so young they they don't they functionally don't know what it is they're looking at. They just know their body's responding to it at first. But what pornography is doing is it's mainstreaming the idea of sadism in the romantic and sexual context. Because the mainstream pornography on the front page of every single site, and I mean Pornhub, X Hamster, work your way through the list. And I again, I, I've talked to thousands of reformed kids. This is what they're watching because it's the first thing they find. They don't have to look for it. Good kids look at this stuff too. It's what they see when they get online. Um, and it, it all revolves around men inflicting pain on women. And this was hugely escalated by the 50 shades of gray trend. Um, several years ago, many of you will know that 50 shades of gray was this torture porn trilogy of novels that was uh, marketed as erotica. It sold over 140 million copies. You know, this, this, this book was for sale at, you know, airport bookshops at Costco at Walmart, people will be reading it next to me on the plane. And then it got turned into a blockbuster Hollywood trilogy that they released on three consecutive Valentine's days. This, this series was protested by domestic abuse survivors and rape crisis shelters because they said, look, this is the story of a man who enjoys inflicting pain on a woman and it all ends up uh, working out in the end. But the reality was that was sort of a plot driven surface level manifestation of what the majority of people were watching. 88% of mainstream porn content features explicit violence against women. Most of it I can't even describe on, uh, you know, to an audience of adults. That's how bad it is. But kids are seeing this stuff in grade six, seven, eight. I first realized that when girls who are 13 years old at Christian schools were handing me handwritten notes asking me why their boyfriends were asking for anal sex, why their boyfriends were asking them for lists of behaviors, all of which are derived from pornography. Because the thing about pornography rewiring your brain is that what you watch is what your body responds to. And eventually your body doesn't respond to anything else. So they're wiring their brain to por pornographic sexual content that sexual content is now primarily violent. Now, when I say cultural consequences, let me give you a, an example of this. It was behind the Me Too movement. It was behind a bunch of major cultural phenomenon. But here in Canada, when a major, what, what passes for a celebrity in, in, in the backwater, uh, you know, was accused of sexual assault by, <coughs> excuse me, 13 women. He, he, he uh, wrote off his relationship as, as Fifty Shades of Grey, said he did hit them, he did choke them, all these things were true, um, but it was consensual. None of that surprised me, but what, was, what really highlighted the cultural shift to me is when Canada's largest and most liberal newspaper, our version of the New York Times, uh, ran a headline announcing that this celebrity had been accused of, and I quote, unwanted sexual assault. And there was an entire cultural shift baked into that phrase. I'd never seen it before. Now I see it all the time. Unwanted sexual assault. With the inherent cultural implication now being that there's such a thing as wanted sexual assault. And that's what pornography and Fifty Shades of Grey and, uh, and these phenomenon mainstreamed in our culture. The idea that sadism, which is, you know, the S in BDSM, um, is, is acceptable in the romantic concept. Like getting off on and causing pain on somebody else is normal. 
And just to give you an idea of how widespread this is in the U.S., the stats that came out last fall, published by the Atlantic Magazine, which is a very liberal publication, as, as most of you will know, they did a major poll of young women between the ages of 18 and 34 and found that 24% felt fear during intimacy due to sudden porn-inspired choking. A uh, parliamentary group in the UK is now launching a study into the same phenomenon. It goes as young as 12 there. That um, uh, porn, um, porn phenomenon is as recent as four to five years old. And it, it, it took over the practical sex lives of ordinary people that quickly. Twenty four, So 380 million people, half of those are women, 24% of women between the ages of 18 and 34, almost a quarter of them felt fear during intimacy because what people see in pornography, they practice in real life. And it's happening in the church, and it's happening all the time. If I had two hours, I could just give you the stories of marriages that fell apart before the couple was 30 because of this kind of stuff. It sounds it sounds almost insane, but the fact is, um, it's uh, you can watch almost any uh, any piece of entertainment in the mainstream, and you'll catch at least one or two references uh, any tiny time when they're talking about sexual encounters, they are there are jokes flying, um, even in a lot, even in like adult cartoons. Uh, you can't get through an adult swim episode without some reference to the exact stuff that you're talking about. That's how fast and how far this has gone. That's mind blowing. Now, um, <laughs> that that is it's almost impossible to recover from hearing that. But let me let me move on. So take take an entire generation of people who has been exposed to this at an accelerating rate from a very young age. You mentioned a lot of relationships coming apart, but um, as these people try to get into healthy relationships and some who are Christians even into marriage, um, what kind of other baggage is that bringing with it that you're seeing? Well, what's really, we are only starting to understand as a church how we are going to grapple with an entire generation of porn addicted young men heading into relationships. Uh, because again, I don't know how old you are, but I was born in 1988. And so roughly like my generation of young men, pornography started to be a problem. Um, you know, parents just really weren't aware <clears throat> of how dangerous the internet could be. My dad actually did sit me down and warn me about porn. Same thing as your dad, though, was about magazines, right? If you ever see a magazine when you're biking to work, make sure you don't pick it up, that sort of thing, right? Now Playboy is sold at, you know, antique stores as a novelty item, Um and so there's there's a, a kind of a division between the first wave of, of porn addicts um, who did access it on the computer, um, but didn't see the sort of stuff that we were just talking about. The new generation of porn addicts didn't get addicted on, on big technology. They all got addicted on smartphones. And so it's interesting because like literally pornography, I was talking about how pornography has affected everything. It's affected the development of technology. So most of you will remember that, you know, phones used to be like this big and look like you were about to, you know, call on a bombing raid over Berlin in 45. And then they got smaller and smaller and smaller. And then we ended up with the Blackberry Pearl. And it looked like that was kind of the trend, right? Small, sleek, you know, you can fit it anywhere, size of a credit card. And then phones started getting, you know, bigger and bigger and bigger again. And you might ask yourself, why? Well, the phone started getting bigger and bigger and bigger again because that's where people watch almost all of their pornography. And because people watch pornography on their smartphones, all of the porn companies have retrofitted their pornography to fit smartphones. And so the first generation that got handed a smartphone by adults, most of whom did not consider the fact that they were basically giving them a de facto porn theater, um, are the ones that got hooked so early we still don't know what detox looks like in its entirety. And so there's some complicated factors here. First, I would say that people have to understand that quitting pornography is A, possible, B, very difficult, harder than quitting almost everything else. Uh, one, because it's accessible everywhere. Two, because the porn companies are looking for you. And three, again, because pornography plugs into natural desires. Um, which makes it different than other addictions. And so what we're seeing now is most young people, if they get addicted at very young ages, will end up needing a counselor or a therapist to work through that. Um, the good news, as Norman Deutsch puts it in his book with neuroplasticity, is the brain can heal itself. And most psychiatrists working intimately with this will say, within six months, your brain starts to heal. Within nine months, your brain starts to rewire. 
but this takes total abstinence from pornography, which now for most young people is probably going to mean that they can't have a device they carry with them with any degree of privacy that accesses the internet. And what's amusing to me as somebody who was born in 1988 is that young people are like, well, that's basically like cutting my arm off, right? Like I went through all those years and I never had access to the internet on a mobile device. And it, you know, seemed like it seemed fine. But now it, it seems like the end of the world for people if, if they can't have a device that carries the internet. The reality is the strength of porn addiction probably precludes their ability to do that for at least a couple of years because they need to detox from this. Porn, porn is stronger than you are, is just the reality of it. There are sins that we can grapple with and there are sins we have to flee from. Porn is stronger than you are. Um, I always point out that Job is the, the one man in the Bible that God called a perfect man when he was talking to the devil about him. And it was Job who said that I need to make a covenant with mine eyes that I, that I, that I don't sin against a woman. Well, if he was saying that the, in the age of the patriarchs, um, you know, where there wasn't a lot of nudity available, I think we should probably be extraordinarily careful today since we are neither perfect nor living in the age of the patriarchs. And so we need to recognize it's a problem and we need to take very distinct steps towards doing it. And we need to have an open conversation that circles around accountability, not excuse making. And so a lot of people uh, use divulging their porn addiction as a way of catharsis. They're not interested in getting help or being held accountable uh, by a brother, a youth pastor, a dad, an uncle, whoever it is that they choose. What they're interested in is getting it off their chest because, you know, they feel bad about it. Um, and so what we what we need to create is a culture of shame around hiding a secret porn addiction and a culture of encouragement around openly coming forward and asking for help. And so I think that we need to destigmatize coming forward with your addiction and seeking help. And we need to stigmatize hiding your addiction and nurturing it in private. Um, and so it's always interesting because people say we need to banish the shame around the issue. I'm like, no, we need to focus the shame. We need to focus the shame on on remaining secretive. We need to encourage and destigmatize stepping forward and asking for help. To, to that end, let, let me ask you ask you something. So uh, it sounds like you've talked to an enormous number of people about this, um, and I think that uh, I think a lot of people are very aware of of how bad the problem is, and especially I'm speaking for Christians. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, what interventions? Do you see institutions, and I'm thinking like schools, churches, any other sort of cultural institution, what kind of interventions do you see being attempted by them and by parents? And to what degree are those things successful or unsuccessful? Paul, oh, there's so there's so much there. Let me start with the parents. Um, there's a fantastic website everybody should look at. Um, it's called Defend Young Minds. Um, it's, it's another one of, uh, these anti-porn initiatives created by the Mormons who are single-handedly at the, uh, the forefront of this fight and they do it all without coffee, which is stunning to me. Um, that's a great website, has great resources for how parents can talk to their kids in an age appropriate fashion. It's got books like good pictures, bad pictures, which I've already read to my five-year-old doesn't use the word porn, just helps them understand that when they are exposed to pornography, not if, but when, you know, they come to you, you can initiate a discussion and you can porn proof them. Uh, parents, just to give you a, give you a warning, your kid may not be looking for porn. Porn's looking for your kids. The porn companies are tagging hardcore porn content with phrases like Dora the Explorer and Paw Patrol, just so that kids find this content. They are also sending pornified pop-ups to online games, with the explicit purpose of making sure your kid ends up on a porn site. If the product is free, your kid is the product. They didn't create those games just to make sure that your kids could have fun. In every Christian school, I ask the kids, how many of you play an online game? 100% of hands go up. How many of you have seen an inappropriate ad playing a game? 100% of hands go up. The game might be innocent, but the ads probably aren't. And so go to Defend Young Minds, uh, have conversations with your kids. We have to start early talk often, open a dialogue. I think that especially in reform circles, and I know a lot of uh, my families were like this, you know, people talk about like the talk, right? Where, you know, um, the mom or the dad talks to the kids about sex for 20 awkward minutes where everybody wishes they were dead and then they never talk about it again. In today's culture, it has to be, it has to start early and it has to can carry on. I know it's difficult. 
but we are going to catechize our children on this issue or the culture's going to. And based on what's out there, we cannot afford to let that happen. It's just horrifying. Mm. Um, and so that the conversation model carries all the way through when it comes to what churches and schools are doing, the number one thing is to have a bunch of older men and women and by older, I mean like anybody above the age of 25. Um, I, I don't, I don't mean, you know, older as in we have to have, you know, 50 to 60 year old wise elders that are doing it. It's, you know, people who, who are willing to talk about this issue to kids and they need to be available. And so when you have presentations in the school and you bring it up, there's got to be a phone number or an email address they can anonymously reach out to if they want help. And at the other end of that phone number and email address is somebody who's going to get in touch with them right away and is going to be willing to help them and walk and walk with them through this. I've seen a lot of communities do that to enormous success is just to provide um, provide a place where kids can reach out when they're feeling desperate. Often after a talk is when, you know, all of what they're what they're doing in private's been exposed, and they really, really want help, and that's that's the best way to do it. And so again, um, it, that's that's part of the process of normalizing getting help and stigmatizing doing this in secret. Because the longer you stay in secret, this is what I always tell the kids: um, I'm not there to you know preach them a three point sermon with an application. Because if that worked, nobody would call me. Um, I'm there to explain to them that the best thing they can do to ruin the relationships they want in the future. Uh, to shoot that in the head is to stop watching or start watching porn right now or to refuse to stop watching porn once they've been made aware of the dangers. But a lot of kids are desperate. A lot of kids are just waiting for us to get it together and to reach out to them. I spoke at a teacher's conference recently and like I had a couple of the principals tell me, yeah, I went home, talked to my kids. Some of my kids were hooked. They were waiting for me to ask, Like they were just waiting to get caught so that somebody mm -hmm. could bail them out of this ditch that they had worked themselves into. Apologies to those of wow. you who think I'm talking fast. I have a, I, on this particular subject, I like to cover as much as I possibly can. So, you, you know, uh, I, I could out talk you. Uh, just let me rev up first. I don't think Perfect. anybody feels bad about that. We're all loving what you're saying. Um, hey, another, another question to ask. So I asked about interventions. You gave us some positive examples. What are the things that we need to stop doing? What are the things that we're doing to help that aren't working? I think the, the the really big thing that drives me crazy that a lot of parents, religious communities, Christian schools do is they bring in a speaker and they have a talk and they're like, we have now addressed the issue of pornography or, you know, pick your issue, right? This gets done with a lot of stuff, but pornography in particular is, is, is an addiction that kids are living with and they need people to walk alongside them and help them get free. And the number of times I've realized when I'm in a, in a church community that like, oh, I'm the thing they're doing so that they can stop talking about this forever, right? Like they've been made aware that there are some kids addicted to pornography, adults as well. So they're going to have a talk at the church. They're going to have a talk at the school. And they're going to be like, wow, that was awkward. I'm glad we did that though. I'm really glad we addressed the porn issue. We, we Sorry, we can't do that. That's not the way the culture works anymore. Um, you know what? Like 30, 40 years ago, fine. Um, you know, there were issues that we can have a good solid talk, you know, sternly talk to the congregation, knowing only a few people had the issue and move on. We can't do that anymore. That's the big one that drives me crazy. And it's very common. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can remember doing that. I, I remember being asked to be that speaker once and the sensation was exactly the same. It was, mm. wait, I'm here so that you can stop talking about this, yeah. not so you can start. Yeah, 100%. Um, and that is that is not a good feeling as a speaker to be the person who is here to put an end to discussion and all mm -hmm. the useful discussion of all this mm -hmm. uh, problem that needs solving. Um, I want to try to pull, pull in a little more positive of a direction. So in about, I'd say in about 10 minutes, we're going to start uh, taking questions. If anybody has anything, uh, go ahead and pop it up in the live chat. Um, but I, I guess I want to ask you, so you, you've spoken to tons and tons of people about this. Mm. And you've ta talked about how healing is possible. Mm -hmm. um, physiologically, it's possible. Spiritually, it's possible in Christ. Um, what do those stories look like? Because it's it's it can be easy to dwell on the dark and bleak of how many relationships can this destroy? How many lives can it numb? How can it make people feel helpless? Uh, but what does it look like when somebody's life pulls out of this mess? That's a great question. Um, so... 
The most encouraging thing I can say is that every person I know who has truly committed to quitting porn has successfully done so. Um, I will stipulate here, though, that it takes it. I, I use the word commitment um, very specifically because I know a lot of people who ne- who are still addicted to porn five, ten years after I talk to them. And that's because they never truly committed to, to a solution. But let me give you my favorite story, my favorite story, because I was actually um, you know, very close to them. Um, and so these are people that I knew since I was four years old. I went to preschool with them. Uh, went all the way through school with them, was close friends with them. I emceed their wedding. And uh, she found him looking at porn shortly after they baptized their second child. And I still remember when she called me, the like the the agony and the hurt in her voice that she'd found this. And I remember um, hearing her talk was the first time I really understood betrayal trauma and the betrayal trauma that women go through when they realize that their their spouse or their partner's been looking at pornography. And I remember asking her to describe to me how she was feeling. And she said, if he's looking at pornography and he's been looking at pornography since he was a teenager, then nothing we've ever had together um, was real. Every time we were together, he must've been thinking about somebody else. It was never good enough because he always needed thousands of other women. Um, Basically what pornography does is it destroys everything in retrospect is that for the other person in their relationship, suddenly nothing they they had with with their with their loved one, all of it is up for grabs. Now, obviously, um, this is why mutual counseling is always necessary in these circumstances. That's not the way m- most male brains function. <clears throat> and many of them see it well, like, no, this is an addiction over here and the silo had nothing to do with you. But the betrayal trauma is real. And what they went through over two years was really hard to watch, but also very gratifying to watch. They put their their, their marriage back together, um, Lego brick by Lego brick, because he basically recognized that his job was to repent. His job was to get count individual counseling. They got marriage counseling. He realized it was his job to rebuild the trust that was broken. And he's this like huge guy with a beard down to here, the kind that my wife will not let me grow runs a framing crew and now he wears t-shirts that say porn kills love. And he talks about it on job sites all over the place on Fridays after they're done work. Um, you know, they burn all the, you know, the old pallets and the cutoffs and stuff from the job site. And he's got a whole bunch of other guys around him. You know, they're letting up their smokes and he's asking them how their, uh, how their walk is, if they're free from pornography, um, how their accountability is going. That guy now uh, has has gotten more people free of porn than most pastors I know, just by ripping the porn kills love shirt, taking every conversation he can get, being being open about his own story, being very like not awkward about it, like a normal guy, like he's a, an incredibly manly dude. Um, so he puts people at ease right away. Um, but not only did does he have just a phenomenal marriage now and is a pillar in his church. But, you know, his story is reshaping the stories of so many guys around him and so many marriages around him. And so every guy who's, you know, rock bottom hooked on porn, I share that story with him and say, that could be your story if you work as hard and you get through to the other side. Yeah, I, I um, you know, one of the things I, w- I would add to that is that's been very much my experience. What I've seen is that probably the most important thing that can happen is to have that first person come forward and be authentic and honest about it for something mm-hmm. other than catharsis, just like you're saying. Mm-hmm. And especially when their story rings true, because like you say, um, it takes year. I mean, it takes take a long time to break this. I'm not saying that you can't, uh, you can't have an amazing experience where, uh, you know, angelic lights come down, you fall to your knees and all of a sudden it's just, it's, it's done. It's over with great. If that's you awesome. But for most people, um, What's going to happen is that Christ will begin freeing them of those, of those desires, um, but you'll go in fits and starts. You'll have screw ups. It's not it's not a pretty story that glamorizes you and it makes you look like a winner. And the first person that co- is able to come forward and, frankly, put on the t shirt and mm-hmm. say, "Hey, porn, porn kills love. This isn't my story anymore. This is the story of something Christ defeated, and it wasn't neat. It wasn't tidy. It took a very long time." Um, it made me feel pathetic at times, but at the end, God's strength and the sport around me prevailed. When when the one person begins sharing that story, uh, you're right. Like I, I have no doubt that what you said is true, that that guy has had more impact 
on more people than a pastor could on the issue because I, I'm paid to talk about this stuff on a stage and people know that they look at me and know I have a conflict of interest and even an incentive to lie and smooth it over. If even if that's if I talk about my own, but that guy can change a mm. lot of lives. And I think in every setting, I'm praying that more of those people come forward. Um, that's huge. The, church, uh, the church needs guys and girls just like that. Yes. Sharing their story and walking with large groups of people. So it's not fair to expect church leaders to bear this burden. And as you pointed out, there are too many people who never will talk to a church leader about this and they're going to need, uh, you know, the construction worker that they relate to that talks like them, sounds like them, and yet gives them the encouragement and the courage they need to do this. Um, I'm going to ask you two more questions before we hand it over to the chat. Uh, the first one is, uh, what do you think, if you had to speculate, or maybe you know, maybe people have told you, if you had to speculate, what do you think people's number one reason is for not seeking help and for not wanting to come on the open? And then the second question I want you to follow up with an answer um, is, if there's somebody listening right now, and actually the odds are that there is, who is struggling, who is ashamed, who maybe has even said that they've gotten over it, but they haven't. Um, what would be your advice to them as to where to start, right? So so to recap, what are the reasons holding people back and where would you tell them to get started? The reason, um, I do know why why most people don't, don't, don't tell anybody about their porn addiction. There's always somebody they're afraid will find out if they come clean with anybody. Um, and so for some people, it's their wife. They've been looking at porn since they were 14. They got married when they were 21. Now they're 25. Um, and basically it, it feels like it got away with them. They were, you know, they were going to quit when they started dating porn hung on, you know, they were going to quit when they got engaged porn hung on. They were going to quit when they got married, uh, porn hung on. It turns out not quitting isn't good practice for quitting. And now they feel like they've lived a lie so long that to come forward, would be to reveal things about themselves they don't even want to admit to themselves. Um, and so the reason that it's not it's not specifically porn addiction that that people have the hardest time admitting. It's the fact that their porn that they've built a life around that porn addiction. Um, because all addicts have to lie to maintain their addiction. They might be small lies, they might be lies of omission, they might be lies of secrecy, but they're doing it. Um, and so it's it, to admit that they have a porn addiction is to admit so many other things. And most people are terrified of that. And in that way, porn addiction is similar to struggling with alcohol or drugs. Um, let's say that you, you're somebody who has one of those addictions and you're good at hiding it, right? To admit a dependency or an addiction on those things would be to admit a lot of other things that you might actually be far more afraid to admit. Um, and so that one's really, really big. Uh, for somebody who's um, who's struggling with it right now and listening to this, I, I say the same thing to everybody. Pick your person. Pick somebody that you can tell. Talk to them in total, total privacy and say, you can't tell my husband yet. You can't tell my wife yet. You're not going to the elders. You're not talking to the pastor. I just need to talk to you about this. Now, when you tell that person, you are giving them permission to hold you accountable, though. They're not just the person who listens to how you feel like garbage because you slipped up again. You are giving them permission uh, to hold you accountable, but start with one person, start with yeah. one person um, and pick somebody who is not also struggling with porn because that never works. Okay. Very good. Well, Hey, I, I, um, we've got some questions that have come up in the chat and mm -hmm. I want to thank you before, before I go to those questions, is there anything else that you really wanted to share that just didn't, didn't happen to come up? No, we covered all the really, really important stuff. Okay. Um, I, I got, you know, like you, I could probably go on about this subject for several yeah. more hours, but, but no, we're, we're, we're covering the stuff that people need to hear. Okay. Well, in that case, let, let me go to the, go to the chat here. There's a couple in here that I think are very interesting. Here's one I'm really interested in getting your take on in part okay. because you, uh, you have your eyes to the cultural horizons. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to seeing how one thing in influences others in the system, uh, that's where I'm curious to hear your take the most and where I've, I've enjoyed reading you so far. So here's, a, here's a good question. Um, 
The podcast, uh, The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling, suggested a connection between Tumblr pornography and the increase of uh, gender ideology. And by that, I assume they mean like trans and queer ideology. Um, what do you think of that? How true do you think that is? I, it's interesting. I thought I had listened to that whole podcast, but I missed that one. I may, I wrote an essay um, when the transgender phenomenon began um, saying that I suspected there was a connection between the extreme violence and pornography and the number of young women who were rejecting femininity. Because with gender ideology, it's interesting. The, the, hor the horrific side of transgender ideology is, of course, all these young people going on, on puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones and opting for sex change surgeries. But there is an enormous percentage of young women who are rejecting femininity and identifying as pretty much anything but a girl. Not going through surgeries, not taking the drugs, not wearing the breast binders, just saying, I'm not a girl. And I speculated at the time uh, that, um, you know, Matt Walsh did that documentary with the title, What is a Woman? Well, if you look at what the cultural answer to the question, what is a woman, um, as informed by pornography that's being consumed by about 90% of males, what is a woman? A woman is a sex object that is a, the target of abuse. That is what high schools look like right now. If you read books written about what American high schools look like right now by like Nancy Jo Salles of Vanity Fair, who wrote The Secret Life of the American Teenager a couple of years ago and went from a flaming liberal to a hardcore anti-porn activist in a year of research. Basically, young women wow. are, are looking at what it means to be a woman and saying, if that's what being a woman is, I'm going to opt out. And then when Abigail Schreier's book, Irreversible Damage, The Transgender Craze Seducing Our Daughters, came out, she had a whole page confirming my thesis, where she actually said a lot of young women she interviewed when asked, why don't you want to be a girl, um, said, if you look at what being a girl means now, uh, if you look at the sexual culture we're expected to participate in, if you look at the type of sexual behaviors that girls are expected to participate in as just part of the romance and dating scene, we'd rather not be girls. And so pornography is hugely contributing um, to the rise in gender ideology. And that because pornography is defining what it means to be a woman in the romantic and sexual context in our culture, especially when you consider its ubiquity and pervasiveness, it's leading a large number of young girls and young women to say, if that's being a woman, no thanks. Can confirm. I, I could share at least one similar anecdote. Uh, man. Uh, okay, here, here, here's another question. Uh, I find this one particularly intriguing and maybe a little bit self-serving as a pastor, but here, here's another one from the chat. Um, how can the church talk about sexual integrity, purity, beauty, uh, when our people in the pews have these struggles? And I'll, I'll add to that question, um, uh, there, there are obstacles when trying to speak to that, when, when my only venues are either off the pulpit or one-on-one, -on -one, because I'm not going to have, I can't, want, the people who need it most aren't necessarily with me always one-on-one, -on -one. but if I'm in the pulpit, there's a, a high degree of propriety expected. Um, I would say, so I, I did something that was big uh, last year, I talked about it, I was preaching on James, James 5. And I felt led, led of the spirit uh, on stage, and I did it in coded language, knowing there were kids there. But I explained, I said, you know, you can have your privacy or you can have your healing, but you can't have both, which is what James 5 says. Um, and, then I, and then I said, I, some of you are struggling deeply with pornography, and I want you to know that that was me for, for years. I didn't get descriptive with it, but e even that in very coded language, that thing that a lot of people were insanely grateful for, felt like walking a tightrope. So in your view, what are we at the church supposed to do? Are we supposed to uh, just boldly speak into it anyway, uh, knowing that people's kids, uh, you know, that the magazines are at head level for the kids, uh, the kids are being handed phones, um, or does there have to be another venue that's created or other language adopted? What advice would you give to talking about this in the church? My my view is, is um, controversial. But it's that's because I think there's a lot of people who have not fully recognized the problem, because I would say that my view is proportionate to the problem we've been discussing this evening. I think that we should use biblical language, which is to say blunt, but not crude. Um, the Bible is extraordinarily blunt about all these issues. And if we could read it in the original Hebrew, I think a lot of people uh, raised with the King James and other versions would be stunned to realize 
just how blunt the Bible is on these issues, and yet the Bible is never crude. And so in my view, and any pastors on this call are, are free to contradict me because this is obviously not my expertise, but my approach personally has been that the Bible is, is blunt, but the Bible is not crude, and therefore that should be our guiding standard, that we should be as clear as the Scripture is clear, um, but of course being very, very careful, recognizing that because these subjects are in some ways inherently crude, that our language should never be degraded. Um, at the same time, I, I think that we have to speak directly into what the needs of the majority of the people are. And we're not doing people any favors by not talking about the one thing uh, that is, is actually robbing them of their happiness, of destroying their walk with Christ, of eliminating their ability to have a happy marriage. I sometimes feel that when, when there's somebody preaching to a congregation of porn addicts, which is most of them at this point, you're almost taunting them with all these fruits of the spirit and all these wonderful things they have, they can have, but there's this huge thing in the way. There's this millstone around their neck and nobody's talking about that. Um, and a lot of people, I know this, they tell me this, they feel despair walking out of church because they think, man, so many of the good Christians must have been so nourished by that, but I've got this big millstone hanging around my neck and I can't actually enjoy a Christian walk until that gets dealt with. Um, and so, you know, telling everybody, you know, how good they're going to have it when they're well, but they're not well, they're sick. Um, I just, I, I, I just, I think we need to deal with this. Fair enough. So, so to sum up, you go, you would say we should get back into speaking as explicitly as the Bible does while being as proper as the Bible is. We yes. need to recapture language. That's a tall order. Um, I have a hard time disagreeing with it, though, but that's a that's a tough call to action. I'm not going to lie. Um, let I'm, me, I'm, uh, open, I'm open to disagreement. I am not a pastor, and so I do not have to make the same calculations as, as folks like yourselves. So well, I someone's going to disagree. It, they're, it's going to be somebody other than me because the trouble is I'm right there with you. <laughs> I'm just commenting on there's a cost. Um, it's not going to be easy for the church to make that turn, but I think we have a duty to go there to some degree. I think or, there's a cost in not doing it too, though, is the issue. I think the cost yeah. is baked in now. There's there's no approach in, in a discussion about strategy on how to deal with this. There's no approach that doesn't involve a cost. You're not wrong. But the idea now is that the idea that I hate is that complacency comes without a cost, that if we do nothing, somehow we're avoiding all these risks. No, by doing nothing, we're letting people wallow deeper and deeper in the poison that's transforming their brain. Uh, and uh, many of you on this call have kids. I don't want to send my kids off on dates and pickup trucks and cars with people who've been pumping this garbage into their frontal cortex for 15 years. And I want us to start as a church community addressing this stuff before my kids are old enough to do that. Fair. Um, let me go to another another question from the chat. I think I think I under, understand this one. Um, it says porn is, porn is the lead attack. Uh, what else comes along with or behind porn um, as anti Christian in our culture? Um, in other words, if if, uh, if if porn is one of the things that if our culture is being pornified, mm -hmm. um, what are the other sort of downstream anti Christian consequences of that? Well, it's really interesting because, as I mentioned earlier, pornography interacts with every other cultural issue and specifically cultural ill. So I wrote this about this in my book, The Culture War, which came out in 2016. <laughs> if you map the trajectory of support for same-sex marriage in the United States with porn usage, the trajectory maps almost perfectly identical. And the reason for that is very, very simple. Um, gay rights activists actually openly talked about the fact um, that if you get people watching pornography, uh, their views on sexuality and mora morality will loosen. If you manage to take a population, um, even a population of Christians, and render them all secret hypocrites on issues of sexuality, then by, by its very nature, you're going to get a lot of support. And, you saw this in, in 2004, California voted against same-sex marriage. America was solidly 65-35 opposed by 2015 with the Obergefell decision <clears throat> that had been flipped. You had 60-40 in favor. Um, and there's a fascinating uh, a little book uh, called um, how, how, um, how the LGBT Movement Brought America to Same-Sex Marriage. Pornography was a key part of that. 
To say it was a strategy might be a stretch. It was recognized as an aid by the LGBT activists, but the people creating porn are doing so to make money. They don't really, really care about social agendas one way or the other. But um, to be very, very blunt, um, the, the very nature of pornography makes people open uh, to sexually unnatural behaviors because you have men watching pornography and obviously there are naked men in pornography as well. So they're seeing things that our grandparents would be like, why would a man want to watch a video in which there is another man? They wouldn't understand this. And yet this is just the norm in, in, in pornography watching. And so a couple of gay rights activists wrote pretty long essays on how um, pornography helped to transform the views of the average American on sexuality. Because pornography is about novelty and because people are constantly watching new things, seeing new things, and because pornography is pushing the envelope yeah. on sexual behavior in order to create new content that people will continue to watch, um, pornography is transforming our attitudes towards sexuality, meaning that most Americans now have a profoundly distorted view of sexuality because of pornography. So yeah. if you look at the LGBT movement, if you look at the legalization of same-sex marriage and the resulting difficulties with religious liberty, if you look at everything from the transgender movement roiling the streets to, you know, drag queen story hour, um, pornography helped make all of that happen. Yeah, I mean, pornography carries with it an implicit worldview. It's making a statement about what the purpose of sex is for. It's encouraging you to use sexuality in a particular way. Um, and therefore, it's making an implicit statement about what 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 the very purpose of it is. And it makes sense that you would graph one movement onto the other, because as soon as you have decided that sexuality is uncoupled from marriage and its purpose and uncoupled from things like procreation and the bond um, of a family, uh yeah all the all the other things would naturally come with it i've never really thought of it that way before but that makes that makes great sense Pornog um, pornography has a worldview as you as you said it and and the world the reigning worldview in both the united states canada and most of the anglosphere now um if you subtract porn it would have taken them 20 years longer why only 20 years do you think it was heading that direction anyway well, so the reason the reason I would say 20 years is because they have other very powerful storytelling mechanisms that they also uh, took over, right? So I, I think that the global entertainment industry, as seen by Hollywood and the music industry, um, have been promoting the LGBT movement for years. And so they would... They would have captured the minds of the hearts uh, the hearts and minds of the youth anyways, I think, but they wouldn't have rewired them. And that's why I think it would have taken them longer. Maybe, maybe they would, maybe it would have fallen apart entirely. That definitely could be true. Um, I'm, I'm perhaps cynical in retrospect, but yeah, you know what? There's, there, there is, there is a case to be made at least that they couldn't have done it without pornography. That's a fair point. Hmm. There's at Let least a case to be made. Piggyback. Here's another question in the chat that I think fits really well with this. Um, so obviously, we see that the church right now is. Uh, to say the church is splintering, splintering over sexual issues somehow even feels like an understatement right now. Mm -hmm. um, so it, with the church uh, splintering over sexual issues, um, is this at all in part or on the whole because of the, the sort of cognitive dissonance created by porn? Let me uh, you have a question, out, Ains? Let me Let me wade out into the ice carefully. Um, I do... So... I think that's true for several reasons. I think every single major Protestant de denomination is going to face a fork in the road on the issue of sexuality in the next five years. I think many of them already are. Um, when a Barna study took a look at the impact of porn on the church several years ago, they found that 51% of evangelical pastors had confessed to looking at pornography uh, in their offices within the last four weeks which is, I think we can all agree, a tremendously high percentage when we consider that these are the moral shepherds of the communities. And I, I, I would just like everybody to ruminate on the potential impact of the vast majority of um, the majority of pastors, but the, the vast majority of, of church leaders having struggled with that at some point or another. It is not uh, that that uh, the that seeing what they've seen may have changed their own worldview. What it what it has done is it it is actually sidelined a lot of church leaders um, who have this personal struggle and therefore feel they can't speak out. 
Hmm. Um, one of the things I despise about pornography the most as somebody who works in the pro-life movement is um, we are missing uh, an enormous number of men in the pro-life movement because of pornography. I realized this years ago, we'd give presentations on, on defending the unborn. All these guys would get all pumped about doing just that. And then they'd vanish after signing up to get involved. I started phoning them saying, so uh, when did you start looking at porn? Every single one of them. And I would hold bet it's- Hold on, you led with that? Yeah, I find it- oh, I find Guts it, of that, I love it. Okay, I find sorry. people are honest when you just ask them though, right? Um, and they, but they all admitted that was the case. And so like what's happening is pornography is spiritually castrating men. And our society has never needed men more, men to stand up for women, to stand up for children, to stand up for their marriages, to stand up for the church. And yet because of pornography, so many good men are, are declining to get engaged in the sort of warfare, cultural and spiritual, that they're commanded to do that. There's so many dragons that need slaying that just get to wander around entirely unmolested by us because pornography has, has sidelined us. And so I think that pornography makes eunuchs out of Christians and that one of the mm -hmm. reasons that yeah. we are losing a lot of these fights is because so many men have been crippled by an addiction that makes them feel like they can't speak out. Wow. That'll preach. Um, here's, here's another question for you. Um, can you, we've talked a little bit about the relationship between pornography and kind of the, the transgender or queer movement. I think this question is aimed more at the, the actual direct influence on individuals. Oh, yeah. So the question is this, can you say something about the relationship, if any, uh, between porn and LGBT tendencies? And I know that's a fraught question. There's a lot of nature nurture questions here. But um, what can you say on that subject? Well, no, that's actually a very easy question to answer because we have data on this. Um, so if you look at what we just discussed about how pornography affects the brain and entrenches our desires, skip the nature nurture question, right? There's, you know, there's, there's people who become um, who there's people who are same sex attracted because they just don't ever remember being attracted to the opposite sex. There's people because of, you know, things that have happened in childhood that have brought those desires out. There's all sorts of different reasons that people experience same sex attraction, but here's what we know for sure is that when people are wondering, am I same sex attracted, which of course is a particularly disorienting and disconcerting thought in a Christian community. Um, the first thing they'll do now is they'll look up pornography to find out if, in fact, they are same-sex attracted. And so 30 years ago, um, if you had same-sex attraction, it might take you a long time to figure out whether or not that was certainly the case. You know, you might have to, you, you, it, would, it might take you a long time to find somebody else who was same-sex attracted in order to experiment with, um, to go to another, to, you know, go to a gay bar or someplace and find out if this was a community um, that you felt comfortable in. Now, however, kids at 13, 14, 15, if they're curious, all they need is a Wi-Fi, a, uh, you know, a Wi-Fi signal on a phone. They can look up gay porn, lesbian porn, whatever it is they think they might be into, and they can confirm very quickly where those attractions are headed. Now, we also know that same-sex attraction is on a scale. Uh, there are some people who could never marry somebody from the opposite sex. There are others um, who, can, who can suppress those desires and also have an attraction to the opposite sex. If those people start looking at um, gay porn almost immediately, though, they're entrenching those desires and making them increasingly difficult to handle later on because of the same rewiring process that would happen with any version of heterosexual porn. I hesitate to, uh, you know, give a, <laughs> to give a, um, an adjective like that to pornography, but you know what I mean? And so I've talked to lots of people who struggle with same sex attraction, who say they figured out at 13, 14 years old because they found pornography right away and knew that's what I'm into. This is what my attraction is. Um, and then of course, by the time they're in grade 12, uh, they've really entrenched this. And so what a lot of Christian leaders have noticed in the last several years is that, you know, there was always people in, in, in Christian communities who struggled with same-sex attraction and might eventually just leave the community and live out that lifestyle. Now, however, you often have kids, you know, who graduate from a Christian high school and boom, they're gone. They're going to leave. Why is that? Uh, Twofold impact. One, they've been looking at gay porn now, since they're early teens, they've entrenched this de uh, desire, they've encouraged it, they've nurtured it, 
And two, social media has given them access to the LGBT community. They've already created digital relationships and a subterranean social network that would have been impossible to create uh, even 25 years ago or 15 years ago for that matter. And by the time they've graduated from a Christian community, um, their desires are entrenched, their alternative community is, is waiting, and they're gone. Wow. All right. Um, th this is a this is a question purely from uh, from me, and I think a lot of if you're watching and you're not a pastor, you have no idea what book I'm talking about or something. Uh, it's a book I would commend to you. It's called "The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self" by and I, I forget the uh, shoot the author is slip, slipping my mind. Uh, I'm sure somebody is shouting it out in their in their brain right now. That book right there. Okay, Carl Truman. It's by Carl, Carl Truman. Truman. Okay, now here here's my question. Yeah, there we go. Now, now the chat's exploding with it. Uh, now here's here's my question. So Charles Charles uh, or Carl Truman's basic thesis there is that uh, one of the big shifts in our conversation comes from a a long a, a slow rolling transformation that's accelerated only re accelerated only recently regarding how we think of self. So if you would have asked my grandfather, "Who are you? What are, you know? What are the foundational things about who you are?" Um, the unshakable things would be things like his religion, his relationship to others, his roles in society. Whereas if you ask somebody nowadays, says Carl Truman, they're gonna tell you they're gonna tell you things about their psychological self, their internal self, and their but we but that we locate our sexual appetites there. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could talk a bit of I wonder as you're talking if pornography has anything to do with people placing sec, uh, sexual appetites at the foundation of their identity because nowadays, you won't hear if you object to somebody's uh, what they'll call their sexual identity. Um, you're not assaulting. You're not assaulting something about them. You're assaulting them as a person. Period. Mm -hmm. uh, such that when they ask for a request to safe space, they they literally see that as a danger to their identity. So, what if any role does porn play in the first of all the building of the credibility for that and the formation of that identity? Well, pornography shapes sexual identities because, quite frankly, much of the behavior that 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 is engaged in now is is a learned behavior because it's not natural behavior. People need pornography to help inform their identity. So, in that that debate I had with the queer studies professor, for example, when I say she agreed with me about ninety percent of porn, the ten percent of porn she didn't agree with me on was what she referred to as ethically sourced queer porn. And I asked her why, if she agreed with me that pornography was mostly wrong why she needed queer porn to be legal. And she said, because without queer porn, queer people wouldn't know how to have sex. And she cited herself as an example that when she realized she was queer, she needed pornography to figure out what that meant sexually because she's not engaging um, in natural sexual behavior. I want to back up a little bit for context because Carl Truman's book is, is fascinating, but a contextual book, it's very short, very powerful, brilliantly written, that's even more helpful at understanding what you just laid out is a book called Primal Screams, How the Sexual Revolution Created Identity Politics by Mary Aberstadt. And her first chapter basically uh, details exactly the scenario you just described with your grandfather, which is before the sexual revolution, um, people knew who they were because they were part of literal tribes, right? My dad came from a family of 11. My mom came from a family of seven. Um, I've got hundreds of cousins and I got five siblings, you know, so I kind of grew up the way that my grandparents did grow up in that sense. If you'd asked me, you know, who am I or who are you when I was five, I would have been like, well, one of, one of them, of course, right? Like I was actually part of, you know, this massive tribe. We, you know, and we, we all went to the same church and, and all of these things created these sort of concentric rings of identity that made sure I never had to ask myself who I was. Now, she makes the point that with the sexual revolution and the sort of the violent rupturing breakup of the natural family, which she points out is the greatest scattering of human beings outside of war, famine and recorded human history. That's what the sexual revolution was in the West, is that because people no longer have these natural tribes, these natural families, they all have to construct their identities from scratch. And she says, the screaming we see on the streets from the Black Lives Matter activists, transgender activists, LGBT activists, from the alt-right identitarians and the far-right activists, all of these people, she says, are engaged in the, the preeminent primal howl of our times, who am I? 
because they no longer have the answers that we had for a thousand years before, which is a child of God, which is part of this community, which is a member of this family. I am I am of those parents and those uncles and aunts and these cousins. And that we're now constructing our identity brick by brick all by ourselves. And she actually, she has a great line. She says, uh, um, essentially, identity politics is the screaming bastard child of the birth control pill. And then she wow. points out that as we're creating these new identities, which are necessary because we no longer have access in, in, in our society to the old identities, um, sexual identities become primary, and then pornography shapes what those look like. And it's really fascinating the way she lays this out. So yes, pornography is shaping what identity politics looks like on the streets. Um, and this is something that that isn't very well understood. And so even in discussions of, of privilege, oh, we've, we've heard a lot about white privilege and critical race theory. I would argue that privilege very much does exist. And if you grew up with two parents who stuck together and loved you, you are waist, head and shoulders above everybody else, even if they were dirt poor, because that you have that. It's an undeserved blessing. So it is a privilege. You know, those of us who had that are no better than people who didn't get that. Um, but that that is the real privilege. Hmm. Well, that though I I, uh, I I just put that on my book list while you were talking. Um, so hey, what are, we're gonna we're gonna start winding down pretty soon. Um, but a couple, couple of last questions. Here's one that just came up. What advice do you have for church or parachurch groups uh, to fight porn, not just on the individual level, but also on the societal level? Um, an ounce of prevention is a pound of cure, right? So things are going further further down. Is there anything we can do on the, on the uh, larger scale rather than just with individuals? Um, well, on a, uh, on a development or sorry, a political level, um, in the states, you've got a great uh, you got a great blueprint, right? Louisiana started by um, instituting age verification um, for porn sites. It ha the reason we know that this is really effective is because the porn sites send every one of their lobbyists to state legislators to scream bloody murder about it. Um, it's really funny uh, when Utah put it in place. Pornhub just banned banned Utah, the state of Utah. Like it's, you know, where, where can I get me some of that? Right. Like, so now Utah has a mandatory age verification and you can't even access Pornhub. In the when did that state. take effect? Just thought, sorry. When did that Louisiana take effect? Was, I think uh, Louisiana was over a year ago now, six of uh, six States have followed them. And there's, an, uh, I think we're up to a dozen States that have declared porn a public health crisis. Well, it's, but Utah as well. See, what's remarkable there is that Salt Lake City, Utah is the number one consumer of porn per capita and internet traffic in the world as of three years ago. So if what you're saying is true, that's that's unbelievable that mm -hmm. Pornhub would ban that state. That's unreal. Uh, I see a question. Who owns Pornhub? Uh, it's a company called MindGeek based out of Montreal, Canada. Um, what... What other is there any other advice you'd give? So you'd say that there's a blueprint on a governmental level. Is there anything that churches or other parachurches can be doing? I know just the stuff we've discussed so far. Start the conversation, okay. keep it open, and give everybody all the help that they like the encouragement to come forward and then the help. Cool. Well, hey, um, I we're we're gonna wind down here, and I just want to thank you for taking the time to be with us. This has been incredibly mm -hmm. helpful. Um, I don't know about you, but I, I'm fascinated enough by the breadth of your knowledge that I could probably just sit here picking your brain for hours on end. Oh, well, um, if you. somebody, if somebody here wanted to follow up and wanted to either read or listen to, or find more of your thoughts on the subject, where would they go for that? I'll drop it in the chat. Perfect. Uh, it's, so it's, it, the website is, how do I do the, the normal, the bridgehead.ca. Okay. The bridgehead, bridgehead.ca. Yeah. Wait. Spectacular. Yeah. That's where I um, just I dump everything there. That's where my books are. And yeah, there we go. Hey, as we as we finish up here, um, I would just like to close us in prayer. I mean, if you're like me, uh, you've probably got a lot to think about and uh you probably have uh, a heavy heart for the next generation and what they're up against. But um our battle is not with flesh and blood, and the one who's backing us up is not either. Um, the one we worship has the power to destroy strongholds. We need not forget about that. And there's no conversation about the sort of stuff that we shouldn't turn to him and instead try to hold in our own power. So let's let's close in prayer a second. Will you pray with me? Um, 
Father in heaven, the conversation that we just had and all the conversations surrounding this one are incredibly sobering. And first of all, on behalf of all of us talking and listening about this, um, we confess that we're part of the problem, that we're sinners, that most of us have struggled with pornography, that most of us have given it given into the spirit of our age, and that sometimes we can be tempted to silence out of our own guilt and shame. And so, God, we declare the grace of Jesus over these sins, and um, we freely receive your forgiveness. But more than that, we freely receive the new identity in Christ, that this is no longer who we are, and therefore we don't need to be cowardly, but we're allowed to speak boldly. We don't speak as sinners anymore. We speak as people transformed by Jesus Christ. That's who we are. And so first, I want to pray for ourselves, that you would help us to each exercise integrity um, in this area of our lives, and to speak honestly and boldly and tell the truth and not be intimidated. God, for those of us um, who are listening, who are actually struggling with pornography, who have felt the grip of it, who have been helpless, who have been lonely, who have had people that in your life that are afraid that they, that they would find out, um, for those of us that have tried many times to quit and have failed, um, I want to pray that you would give us the courage uh, to, to go talk to somebody. We've confessed our sins to you, and we know that that our forgiveness is not dependent on whether or not we talk to somebody besides Jesus, but our healing just might be. And so I want to pray that um, that your Holy Spirit would empower people in their new identity and give them the courage to go confess and speak to that one person that they need to speak to. And for all the other others that uh, we're going to go forth as impact, it, go forth in impact, be it as parents or as pastors or as brothers or sisters and friends. Um, I want to pray that you would let our light, let your light shine through us. I want to pray that the church could become a compelling contrast of bright up against the darkness in a community that is passing away and self destructing. Um, let us be the ones that point the way with our lives and with the change you bring to us towards your wholeness, and may you receive all of the glory. All this we pray in Jesus' name, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Thanks for joining us today, everybody, and you all have a good night.